I'm uh, Lawrence Mee. Um, I'm the director of the Scottish Association for Marine Science, uh, SAMS. Uh, SAMS is one of the oldest um, uh, marine institutions in, in Europe. It was uh, founded uh, just over 125 years ago uh, by Sir John Murray, who was the person who coined the word oceanography for the world. And uh, at first it was in Edinburgh, then moved to an island uh, called Great Cumbria, and came here to Dunstaffenage uh, about uh, 30 years ago. Um, and has now, uh, this site, Dunstaffenage, has now been renamed as the uh, Scottish Marine Institute. Uh, so we are 150 people here doing all kinds of research, um, multidisciplinary research, uh, with the central objective of creating uh, sustainable seas for the future. Uh, my own journey uh, has been a, a, a much more complicated one, I think, even than Sam's. Uh, I studied oceanography. Uh, in the University of Liverpool uh, and uh, my uh, research work was in the Pacific coast of, of Mexico, south of Acapulco, looking at coastal lagoon systems and uh, uh, working uh, with local people using some quite sophisticated equipment at the time, uh, but trying to engage also in, in local problems. Uh, following that, uh, I worked for 10 years as a, a lecturer in the uh, researcher in the National University of Mexico, uh, based in uh, both Mazatlan and uh, Mexico City, and working all over Latin America and doing some work also with the, with the UN. Um, I was uh, responsible for the uh, uh, construction of the first uh, uh, purpose-built uh, deep-sea research vessel for, for Mexico as well. Um, I joined uh, the United Nations after that and uh, uh, became uh, head of the Marine Environmental Studies Laboratory in uh, uh, Monaco, uh, part of the IAE, uh, International Energy, Atomic Energy Agency Laboratory there. I was funded by, by UNEP. And at that stage, uh, my work was uh, worldwide. I was looking at things like uh, pollution problems, uh, helping to set up uh, pollution programs all over the world. And I was also engaged in the um, process uh, prior to the uh, UN Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, uh, which um, uh, established uh, Agenda 21 and Chapter 17, which was the first real uh, international uh, declaration of, of uh, planning for the future of the seas and oceans, a very valuable document which hasn't really been improved on since. Uh, while we were developing uh, Chapter 17, uh, uh, we wanted some way of testing it. and. Uh, I became very interested in uh, the declining state of the of the Black Sea, and it was the time when uh, the Soviet Union was uh, was collapsing and uh, and, and opening up. And uh, I did some uh, trips to uh, the uh, newly independent countries in the Soviet Union. They had been independent for weeks in some cases, uh, looking for um, trying to help uh, bring people together to uh, uh, develop a consolidated plan uh, for. Uh, repairing the damage to the Black Sea, based along the lines of, of Chapter 17 and incorporating some of the new thinking that we, we had included. And uh, this was uh, very much supported by, by some of the people I met, including the Minister of Environment of Ukraine. And uh, uh, he suggested that it would be great to have a, a ministerial uh, agreement for the Black Sea. And uh, we were able to bring together uh, all of the uh, ministers of the environment from the six Black Sea countries and uh, uh, my responsibility was to act as a kind of uh, negotiator between them and uh, uh, bring them together and uh, we produced the uh, Black Sea Ministerial Declaration which was one of the first uh, uh, documents to emerge from uh, the Rio process and also uh, the first environmental agreement in the, in the uh, uh, newly formed Commonwealth of Independent States. Uh, so. Uh, uh, this then created an opportunity and we seized the opportunity to uh, start a global environment facility project uh, which I was uh, invited to manage um, and uh, for the next five years I worked in Istanbul uh, developing and managing the Black Sea Environmental Program which was a, a bringing together of, um, of people that had been disconnected for, for many many years in, in some cases and sharing information openly that they hadn't been able to share in the past. And, uh, having a, a better understanding of the system they were working with. Uh, the process is still going on today. Uh, when I left in 1998 to return to academia, uh, we had a, 
a project that had about uh, 110 uh, million uh, euros of funding from different places to try to uh, test some of the approaches that we had developed and we had developed a Black Sea uh, strategic action plan which was uh, 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 working uh, at that time and has since been updated. So uh, that took me back to academia and uh, uh, in uh, 1998 I uh, returned, uh, uh, joined the University of Plymouth uh, was still uh, doing work uh, half-time for the UN, uh, helping to develop projects in different parts of the world, including the Benguela Current and the Humboldt Current in south of Peru and uh, uh, other coastal projects. Uh, I was uh, supported also by a Pew Fellowship in uh, uh, Marine Conservation, uh, which I uh, used to de develop uh, environmental education programs. And I was appointed as uh, the Professor of Marine and Coastal Policy. And, uh, and uh, afterwards as director of the Marine Institute in the, in the University of Plymouth. So that was, that was a, a, a another, another career and uh, uh, two years ago I took on uh, the directorship of, the, of, of SAMS and uh, it's, a, it's a great place to be, a, a, very, a very happy place and at a, at a really good time. Now in that process, uh, because we had been exploring uh, and doing research on, on large marine and coastal systems, we had the opportunity to engage in and develop uh, large European projects. And uh, partly uh, that was also in tandem with the work we were doing uh, with uh, LOEX. Uh, I was a member of the Scientific Steering Committee of LOEX. And uh, again, this was a source of, of many ideas for, for some of these projects. And of course, LOEX also benefited from engagement in these projects. Uh, the first one we developed was called ELM, uh, European Lifestyles and Marine Ecosystems, where we wanted to see what the impacts would be of the rapidly changing uh, post-accession lifestyles in Europe on the marine system, the other end of the conveyor belt. Uh, we joined Spicosa, which uh, was taking a systems approach to coastal areas and looking at, uh, at the interaction between people on the coast and their, uh, in the immediate seas around them. Uh, and developing a systems analytical approach to that. And then following the successful conclusion of ELM, uh, we developed an even more comprehensive project called uh, uh, No Seas, uh, which is to help provide some of the science to underpin uh, the development and uh, implementation of the Europe's Marine Strategy Framework Directive. And that's where we are today, uh, in a beautiful place, the least populated part of, of, of Europe, uh, with the birds singing behind us uh, and, uh, and the, the, the glorious uh, sea on a, a <coughs> typically sunny day here on the west coast of Scotland, um, where we uh, are happy to uh, invite people, uh, bring them here to share their ideas in a, in a, in a lovely environment, uh, uh, which I think has been the generator and hopefully will be the generator in the future of of many ideas that take us forward into better management of our marine and coastal space in Europe. So for my heritage lecture I'm going to talk about redesigning our seas and coasts, a, a tale of adaptive management. And the work I'm going to present is um, arises from several projects and institutions and I have to thank them for the inspiration uh, that they've given and uh, many of the ideas that I've tried to uh, knit together as I present this project and the, the three key projects here are, are Spicosa, um, ELM which is the European Lifestyles and Marine Ecosystems Framework 6 project and uh, which I coordinated and uh, no seas, uh, which is uh, knowledge-based management for Europe seas, uh, which is a current FP7 project that I'm also coordinating. So uh, thanks for all of the colleagues that participate in those projects and uh, have uh, helped me to uh, have uh, lots of ideas, often in the shower in the morning, uh, that I've uh, tried to integrate into this. So a special dedication uh, for this lecture to Slarty Bartfast, uh, the designer of coasts, especially fjords. Uh, for those that, of you that enjoy the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, Slarty Bartfast was a very special character because after the Earth had been destroyed by Vogons, uh, who were the ultimate uh, international or intergalactic uh, bureaucrats, uh, Slarty Bartfast was called in to redesign a new planet Earth. And, um, 
Uh, he particularly liked designing coastlines and uh, wanted to create fort fjords in Africa, but uh, thought it would be very difficult to explain to future generations uh, how uh, they came to be. So Slati Bartfar says, perhaps I'm old and tired, but I think that the chances of finding out what's actually going on are so absurdly remote that the only thing to do is to say, hang the sense of it and keep yourself busy. I'd much rather be happy than write any day. Uh, and Arthur asks, and are you? No. Well, that's where it all falls down, of course. So uh, I think that applies to most of us scientists. Uh, we uh, try to hang the sense of it sometimes, but... Uh, Curiosity keeps uh, nagging us, and uh, complexity is all about that. Complexity is about sometimes saying, "Well, we just accept things as complex as they are, and and try to move on." But simply, always in the back of our minds is the niggling doubt that perhaps we can explain just a little more. When we look at our seas and coasts, uh, we are constantly facing an issue of changing perceptions, as we. Uh, it have inhabited and become the uh, most dominant uh, mammal um, ever to uh, exist on this planet, uh, we have changed the environment uh, we live in um, enormously. And each time we change it, we come from one generation to the other to accept some of the changes we've made. And so we're living with all kinds of legacy of the past. And uh, these legacies of the past, we, we can't, there's no going back on, on them. We can't undo them. Uh, we simply have to keep moving on. Uh, but moving on can lead to a kind of spiral of decline. Uh, a good example of this is the shifting baseline for North Sea Cod. Have a look at this diagram. You can see how, how North, the catch of North Sea Cod has declined from the early 1960s uh, to the present. Year on year, there are some good years, there are some bad years, but year on year it has been going down. And clearly, um, we can see from this graph what was a good year. This is a good year um, in, in 1971 where there were lots of cod, price went down, uh, people started investing in more and more fishing boats. But then, shortly after, that was a bad year. And uh, a bad year is when people start to talk about uh, what to do when the stocks begin to collapse and, and start to take measures. And uh, what we're seeing now is um, recently uh, people have been talking again about a good year. But of course if you compare a recent good year with a bad year from the late 1970s, you'll find that uh, a bad year then would be a good year now. And this is an issue of shifting baselines and it's an issue of our changing perception. What we would now put in a newspaper as a good year for cod uh, in the 1970s would have been a disastrous year's fishing. And it's that issue of perceptions between generations, from one generation to the other, uh, that leads to this uh, phenomenon of environmental decline which we are all suffering. Now, I want to talk about the complexity that underlies this. And to illustrate this, I have a, a, a nice uh, photo I took of a, a, from a uh, a discussion session in the LOICS meeting on, on, on Coastline and uh, we have these great discussions around the board about uh, how a system really operates and uh, um, I don't need to tell you how complex it is, uh, the picture tells, tells the whole story. Uh, if we look at the, the real environment and I'm looking here at uh, two pictures from the, the North Sea, you will see how uh, we have developed such a uh, intricate complexity of uses of the sea. On the left-hand diagram you can see some of the uses uh, that the sea has been put to uh, that are not for fishing. Uh, we have crisscrossed the North Sea with pipelines and power cables and we have oil rigs and we're building wind farms and we have special areas for conservation uh, and all kinds of uh, sand extraction and, and, and many, many other uses. And unfortunately, we've also used it for, for dumping a lot of our waste. That's one side. If you look on the other side at that uh, red and yellow uh, uh, diagram, these are fishing vessel tracks. Uh, these are fishing vessels above 15 meters tracked by, by satellite in 2002. And you can see that coinciding with those areas that are crisscrossed with lots of other activities and, and, and wind farms and all kinds of things are the densest areas of fishing. In fact, we're ploughing the bottom of the North Sea several times a year. 
So there is no mistaking. Uh, we have uh, considerably, uh, and perhaps um, in terms of uh, human existence, permanently altered uh, that system. And it's a system that most people never see. They just see the surface of the water. They see the, the kind of green, dirty brown of the south of the North Sea, which has always been green, dirty brown as far as we know, uh, because it's a mixture of sediment that's resuspended and, and, and phytoplankton. Maybe, though, in the distant past, it wasn't so, so dirty brown, because uh, if we go back several generations, the North Sea, the, the bottom, at least parts of the North Sea, had some of the largest uh, oyster beds uh, in, in Europe. Uh, there's not a trace of them now, and those oyster beds must have uh, been uh, the uh, centre of a fundamentally different ecosystem from the one we have today. Now, nobody's talking about getting the oysters back, but the pristine environment would have been fundamentally different uh, than uh, what we would consider to be a clean environment nowadays. And it's often worth reflecting on that. Look at the Irish Sea. This was an Irish Sea pilot study done looking at uh, people who claim areas for their own use. Uh, and uh, uh, each of those different colour codes are people who uh, are regarded as legitimate users of the sea and require a bit of its space. And you can see that they're all overlapping and, uh, and the fact that they're overlapping is because so many people have, have, have different claims. And uh, uh, most of those claims are unresolved. And also they're managed by, by different institutions and people and stakeholders. And uh, uh, we, we really have very rarely looked at the whole system, the system as a whole, to try to, to, to understand and, and grasp how to use it. Now, if, if we look with uh, the... Um, hindsight and the, 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 the knowledge we get from hindsight at the footprint in the UK over time, we can see how uh, it has gradually shifted offshore. This diagram um, starts in the mid-19th uh, century looking at uh, the footprint from uh, four things, eutrophication, chemical pollution, habitat loss and overfishing in rivers, estuaries, the coastal shelf and the deep sea in the UK. Now, uh, it's based on, on real data, on anecdotal information and expert opinion. It's all mixed together to create this diagram. And uh, the things on the left, which you can see on your computer screen, are uh, uh, the kind of indicators of what was going on on the land ar around that time, not necessarily what caused the problems. So, back in the 1850s, uh, there were already environmental problems. In 1858, the Houses of Parliament in London had to be closed down because of what was called the Great Stink. Um, uh, so much sewage going to the River Thames uh, that the smell drove out uh, the, the, the uh, entire uh, government uh, out of the Houses of Parliament. And uh, estuaries were clearly uh, impacted at that time. But as we developed uh, more technology... Um, we started to move that uh, impact offshore from rivers to cover estuaries. Our ports required deeper and deeper water and went closer and closer to the sea. Our fishing fleets uh, were able to fish further and further offshore because um, we started to develop steam trawlers and companies that operated steam trawlers so that they could be more powerful and work together. We had rail transport to start shipping marine products to centres of population. Uh, so suddenly uh, the fish trade became really important, and not just for the people that lived on the coast. And refrigeration to keep things fresh. And with each of those technological developments, our footprint moved ever onwards, deeper into the, the sea. By the beginning of the uh, 20th century, we were starting to ship oil around the world. Um, we had a chemical industry. Uh, ports became bigger, uh, pollution started to become a problem and uh, um, we started to see the first oil spills um, and uh, we also started to see I increasing uh, evidence of habitat loss in coastal areas. So already uh, by 1925 people were standing up and giving speeches uh, about uh, the state of our seas. It's not something that has happened so recently uh, but we have forgotten. Between 1925 and 1950 uh, was the rapid development of radio communications. Now that was important because it meant for fishing fleets that they could talk to each other 
and they could start to fish really systematically. They could have a fleet that goes out and really systematically fishes out uh, stocks. And uh, we started to see that problem of overfishing shifting, shifting down uh, further from the, from the shelf uh, into the deeper sea. And of course we had the phenomenon of war. War in the North Sea gave the, gave the fish stocks a bit of a break and they, they started to recover. But then shortly after that people started to, do, to dump all of the used munitions in the bottom of the sea and, and we ended up with uh, lots and lots of bombs and, and toxic chemicals and, and uh, chemical weapons which people are still pulling up, uh, often not, um, in, in troll nets um, uh, from time to time today. So things got rapidly worse uh, after the uh, Second World War. Now. What happened then was that we started to reach the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution was a huge revolution in the way we practiced agriculture. So we got into intensive agriculture and uh, uh, as a result of the work of, of Fritz Haber and others we had the Haber process and it was possible to make nitrogen fertilizer out of thin air. And, uh, and so um, there was no longer a problem. If you had enough energy, you could produce nitrogen fertilizer and fertilize your crops and increase the amount of land that, uh, that was used. And we were importing phosphate fertilizer from all over the world. So a sudden massive increase uh, uh, in, in agriculture and an intensification of agriculture. And of course, the end of the conveyor belt from agriculture is the sea. So the sea started to receive more and more nutrients and we had this relatively new phenomenon of eutrophication that started. And uh, the seas became greener and seaweeds changed their characteristics. Now, this was uh, not perceived at the time. It, it happened little by little. And it wasn't really until much later on when we started to get Z dead zones, for example, the dead zone in the Black Sea, that, uh, that we realized that things had gone so terribly wrong. But it was already too late uh, when things were, were dead. Uh, fish um, stocks were being um, mined down by trawlers that were working uh, more and more efficiently further and further offshore and habitats were being destroyed in the process unseen uh, because we have so little uh, information on what's on the bottom of the sea and sadly we still do. So over to 1975 to 2000 uh, aquaculture, globalization, deep water fishing all of those extending our footprint over the shelf down into very deep waters uh, down into a thousand, two thousand meters and you only have to see what's happening now in the, in the Gulf of Mexico to know uh, what happens when you don't understand the system properly and start to, to use it and abuse it. On the other hand, uh, after 1975, we had the development of environmental institutions and NGOs. People started to wake up to the problems. They started to demand action. And the whole environmental movement and, and the whole of environmental science started to, to take off. But it was playing a catch-up game and uh, what we now need to do is not play a catch-up game but to play an overtaking game where we get ahead and we're able to start planning and looking at our future. So my last box there is 2000 plus. Unfortunately global warming which we can no longer avoid. Urban development that we've locked ourselves into. Coastal squeeze because of uh, increasing sea levels. Um, squeezing those coastal habitats uh, into a narrower and narrower area. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we're learning. People uh, right from the 1970s started to demand action in rivers and you can see on my diagram that rivers are now shown as, as, as cleaner and estuaries which are getting cleaner because people demand action. And I would like to think that in the next uh, 25 years from 2000, the next 15 years now, uh, we would start to see clean up on coastal shelves and that people uh, can perceive the environment in a different way and start to deal with it. Now, the name of the game at the moment is the ecosystem approach. And uh, the ecosystem approach has many uh, very complicated and bureaucratic definitions, but I like this one that came from uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources in Ottawa in Canada. It's simply a resource planning and management approach that recognizes the connections between land, air, water and all living things, including people, their activities and institutions. I think a simpler way even then is to say what it does is put people back into the ecosystem. 
we've often talked about the ecosystem as something over there that we we're not really uh, we're not really engaging with it kind of has a separate existence than, than humanity the ecosystem approach says no uh, the management of the system depends on us and our knowledge of it and we have to engage with that reality point I want to make about these uh, newly defined uh, social ecological systems is that uh, they operate on varying scales and they're also unpredictable and this picture taken uh, only a couple of weeks ago by uh, BP at the bottom of the uh, at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico shows what can happen uh, unpredictably we have never uh, rationally following a systems model predicted this massive oil spill at the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico which has totally overwhelmed uh, huge uh, uh, benthic systems perhaps even causing extinctions and and so it is that um, uh, although we can go some distance towards predicting how things will change uh, the unpredictable is often and the unpredictable that is a cause of human and natural system uh, non-linearities uh, happens and uh, and we have to accommodate that in our management system and, and it's important to reflect on that people have been using for the last 20 years it's called the DPSIR although as a result of our NOSIS project we've uh, relabeled it DPSWR now it's a it's not really a model it's a conceptual model what it shows us is how we can simplistically look at how uh, the uh, social and ecological system operates at the top of the diagram you'll see a box marked socio-economic drivers now the socio-economic drivers are the things that we do in our society uh, the way we develop our economy we build factories we build cities uh, we we have demands for energy all of those things are the drivers of our of in, in a sense of, 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 of the system now those drivers those uses of natural environmental uh, resources um, uh, uses of goods and services uh, introduce pressures on the environment so the, the middle box are our environmental pressures environmental pressures could be uh, sewage going down a pipeline nutrients going down a river it could be people fishing in the sea these are environmental pressures uh, as a result of our uh, socio-economic drivers and the pressures produce changes in the status of the environment uh, because of course taking fish out of the sea um, is a state change that we uh, we probably feel comfortable about as long as we don't overdo it uh, some of the things we don't feel comfortable about but uh, whatever the pressure on the environment we probably do cause somewhere or other some kind of, of change in its state and of course uh, we can change the state of the environment to a point where um, it influences human welfare now by human welfare I don't mean that it puts people out of jobs although it might be the case but it, it, any change in human welfare and perceptions people standing up and saying I don't like this it affects my interests so if we're affecting people's interests in any way whatsoever this is having an effect on human welfare it can be psychological welfare as well and it's when people's welfare is affected that they start to say we need action so out of that human welfare box is a line going to policy responses because when people uh, feel affronted or when people perceive that they might feel affronted because there's a problem that might be happening uh, they then uh, ask for uh, or demand action so that policy response box is very important and policy responses can be at the level of drivers um, people saying well we, we would like to manufacture our cars in a different way or use less energy um, these are the solutions that are quite hard to achieve but very sustainable they can be on the pressures they can be let's build a treatment uh, plant and, and get rid of this problem so it's no longer affecting the sea or they could be at the level of welfare which is saying okay some people have lost uh, their jobs or their interests let's compensate them now of course we would like to see um, those uh, responses at the highest possible level because that really does solve the problem but all three responses are legitimate and are employed now the other thing that comes out of this diagram is that I've colored it in two ways the orange part of it is the coloring of our social system 
and the yellow part is our ecological system. Now the yellow parts studied by natural scientists and the orange part tends to be studied by social scientists. And unfortunately we've developed two different languages for those branches of science and it's quite difficult to get them together. Uh, they even think, they have a different epistemology, they think in different ways. And part of the challenge for us if we want to work with the whole system is to develop a common language between uh, the different branches of science that are engaged in studying it. And uh, that's one of the reasons that we have these large international projects like uh, Elm, Spicosa and, and Noces and many others. Now, some people use this word impacts. So I've put a line around here to show where the impacts are. Uh, for some people and some organisations, impacts are the state changes. Uh, for others, impacts are the uh, changes to human welfare. It depends where you're coming from. So. We've taken that word impacts out of our DPSIR and called it DPSWR to make it really clear what we mean. Um, and we've recognised that impacts can have a very broad meaning, but we accept that. You can also say, well, what about the other things that are going on, like climate change? Well, of course, um, this system that we're looking at here is a system that is probably um, housed within other systems because uh, all of these uh, systems are interconnected. And so there are external factors that affect the system that I've outlined here. Uh, human climate change is a long-term uh, uh, system change which will affect the drivers, the pressures and of course impinge on uh, the state of the environment. And if we have to add to this the joker in the pack which is uh, natural system variability uh, which we're still trying to understand because unfortunately our data sets are so uh, short uh, that uh, we are um, finding it very difficult to understand things that occur at time scales of, of 30 or 40 years and we have to use uh, things like paleoceanographic techniques to try and work out uh, what happens and sometimes scientists get it badly wrong by saying uh, oh the, the temperature is going up and base that on four years data and then it goes back down again of course because uh, they're looking at the cycle and that doesn't mean global warming doesn't exist it means that we haven't factored in natural system variability so it's important to understand these external factors now, before I go on, I'd like to say something about the kinds of problems that exist in the environment. And I've, I've taken from a, this fantastic paper by uh, Sven Gentoff and, 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 and uh, uh, colleagues uh, on fisheries and coastal governance as a wicked problem. Now, uh, management um, uh, scientists have uh, used uh, uh, this terms wicked and tame for some time. And a tame problem is one that can be solved, can be fixed. I think that's the best word for it. It's a problem that has a fix. So um, uh, the, the problem exists, it can be studied, a solution can be proposed and, and you get an outcome. It might take some years but it's very, very clear. Linear thinking, politicians love it. Scientists like it as well because they get patted on the back because they developed a fix. A wicked problem on the other hand is a problem that doesn't have an immediate solution. And it involves hard social choices that might involve losers as well as winners. And it involves moral judgment and value-based decisions. And most of the problems in the marine and coastal environment, unfortunately, are wicked problems. There is no clear solution. The eternal search for uh, a win-win solution is often uh, entirely wrong because there's always somewhere lurking in the background a loser. And uh, we have to understand how to deal with those losers, negotiate with them and compensate them or give them other alternatives if necessary. Uh, but we have to accept that hard choices have to be made. And hard choices can't be based on science alone. They have to be based on moral judgment. And that really means that we have to understand what people's values are and how they're formed. And forming values about the marine environment is very hard because most of it isn't seen by the general public. So we have, to, we have to help them see uh, the environment and understand it so that they can form their own values and perhaps uh, try to uh, exploit it uh, and protect it in a more sustainable way. Now, one way of doing this is a process called adaptive management. I'm, I've called this positive thinking for an uncertain future. And, and this, is, uh, this is the sort of last part of my talk because I think adaptive management offers a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, perspectives for the future. I'm going to take you through it. So, 
we start with our understanding of what the system looks like at the moment. Um, so we have uh, baseline studies and um, we uh, scientists have helped to develop methods to do that and we need to make an assessment and uh, assessments are happening all the time but sometimes they only look at part of the system they assess the natural side of it or the social side of it but rarely uh, assess it in a joined up way so we need to look at the state of the marine environment we need to look at the pressures and their human causes but we also need to understand the institutions, laws, policies and economic instruments that will help to, uh, to uh, lead to some of those elegant solutions that we all hope will exist. And of course scientists can help to find emerging issues. We don't need to always look at the past. Uh, some people say that environmental management is a bit like driving down a motorway using only the rear view mirrors. We, we need to try to look at the future and try to uh, perceive um, some of those issues that, uh, that uh, are beginning to occur and try to plot how they might happen in the future. We need to do some, uh, some, some uh, horizon scanning in this. Now, as a result of this assessment, we need to talk to people. We need people to work with us in the science community and we need people in uh, positions of power uh, to co-design some kind of measurable aspirational goal for the future. And the question is a very simple one. We say, how would you like the marine environment to look in 20 years? Now, uh, that's a scary question for most people. That's a question I used to put to my students, and, uh, and usually over Christmas, which is probably not a very nice thing to do. But uh, they, um, it's a challenging and important social decision. We, we need to know where we're headed. There's no going back. Uh, we, can't, uh, we can't reinvent uh, uh, animals that we have uh, uh, made extinct. Uh, we can't tear down our cities. Uh, we can't uh, um, change our entire economy. So we have to move forward and we need to understand the trajectory for moving forward and we, we need to have some kind of common vision of where we want to go. So the first challenge is to set a vision. Now, that in Europe is being defined by something called the EU Marine Strategy Directive, which was approved uh, only uh, last year. And the centre of the Marine Strategy Directive is something called good environmental status. And that word good is very important because uh, it, good is not a property of a natural system. Uh, good is a human defined thing. The environment doesn't have a good or a bad, it just exists. Uh, the word good is something uh, which is a human quality that we, 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 we put on the environment. So we are asking people to define something uh, within the next uh, few years, very few years, called good environmental status, which is where we want to be by 2020. Because the EU Marine Strategy Directors asks countries to achieve good environmental status by then. And first you have to define it. So actually, we're, we're, not, we're asking that very difficult question I ask my students to the whole of society. And I, I guess the whole of society doesn't know that yet, but uh, uh, I know that a lot of politicians are scratching their heads at the moment thinking, how on earth can we define and agree with our neighbours? Because that's very important. A lot of our seas are shared with our neighbours. How can we define this, this thing called in good, good environmental status? Well, uh, it's a valid and important question because uh, it's something we, we should have been thinking about for many, many years in the past. Now, once we define that, we need to take a first step towards it. 2020 seems a long way. Actually, it is not that far, uh, but it's still quite a long way. It's certainly uh, outside most terms of office of a politician. Um, so we need some targets and policies that will help, like stepping stones over a river, take the first step towards the vision. And uh, so uh, countries are developing regional, national um, uh, policies, um, like for example here in the UK we have the UK Marine Bill, or in Scotland we have the Scottish Marine Bill, and these are clear, um, it, clear uh, statements of policy which will say exactly what measures will be taken over the next few years, and ultimately this is towards achieving this thing which we call good, that we haven't quite defined yet. And so we are introducing things like environmental targets and spatial planning and new regulations and things. We don't know whether all of those will get us to this good, uh, but it's a first step. 
and we can always look at them after four or five years and see if uh, they've gone far enough and, uh, and uh, if those actions have taken us in the right direction. Science can provide uh, some kind of robust qualitative quant and quantitative system state indicators to measure impact. And a lot of people are working on that at the moment. We can use uh, operational indicators, uh, process, pressures, society and governance to see whether we're achieving those uh, new um, goals that are set by legislators. And uh, it's not just a question of gathering data because often the, um, the data doesn't exist. It also involves uh, the use of models. And projects like uh, Spicosa and ELM and NOCES um, uh, spending a lot of effort uh, designing models to, to test some of the assumptions that are behind uh, these uh, uh, societal objectives and, and new policies and measures. So models are critical. Uh, it's not all about models, but models help us to test whether perhaps we're going in the right direction. So models. Well, this is a simple conceptual model for the North Sea. Very simple. It has uh, on the top um, all of the uh, um, the drivers, these are economic uses of the North Sea, the middle bit are the pressures and the bottom bit are the state changes. So it's only a, a bit of the DPSI, it's the, it's the DPS bit of it. Um, and uh, the pathways on here are not necessarily mechanistic pathways, it's just an indicator of what, which uh, uh, driver will cause which pressure and how that might cause a state change. And as you can see it's already uh, getting pretty complex. Uh, we've shown in dark red here uh, the most important pathways which we used in ELM project to, to model. Uh, but uh, it is uh, a complex world out there and uh, each of those drivers uh, usually um, belong to a different sector and those sectors don't really talk with each other very well. So the idea of governance is, is of getting all of those people together and, and trying to help them work together towards um, this uh, goal which we have now set of good environmental status. Now in the North Sea it's pretty important what we do because at the moment uh, our models show that if we carry on as we are we'll have a whole series of winners and losers. Uh, the winners will be uh, phytoplankton and what we call trophic dead-end species including jellyfish. Uh, trophic dead-end species are those species that are pretty useless for the rest of the food chain and won't, won't lead to fish. So if we fill up the North Sea with jellyfish we won't have a lot of fish, we'll have a lot of jellyfish. And, uh, we don't really eat those in Europe. Um, the winners could include estuaries though because as I've shown we're already cleaning them up. So that's a bit of positive news. The losers comprised of seabirds that depend on things like sand eels and small pelagic fish. So my, my puffin could be a symbol of decline. In fact, puffins are declining because sand eel populations have been declining. And losers are also uh, bottom water demersal fish such as plaice, cod, haddocks uh, and, and uh, other animals and plants that form seabed habitats that we're constantly trawling up. And I think we have some good news there because uh, finally uh, the um, uh, cod recovery plan under the old um, uh, uh, the, the old fisheries legislation, the common fisheries policy, is beginning to be effective, and we're seeing the gradual recovery of cod, but still to a level which we would have said would be bad uh, in the late 1970s. Okay, so. Winners and losers, that's what politicians are, uh, uh, are interested in and that's what our models can predict, which way the balance goes. Now monitoring is essential for adaptive management. If we don't monitor we won't know the state of the environment, we won't know whether our policies are being uh, properly implemented or not. So uh, regular monitoring is, is, is completely essential and of course the regulations and compliance uh, the policing of those uh, national level policies is critical and it of course depends also on the, on the monitoring and that's the fast feedback loop in the system. There's also a slow feedback loop because our regular monitoring gives us an idea of the status and trends of the environment and tells us whether we're heading towards this thing called good environmental status. And every uh, six years or so under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive we'll have to do a new assessment 
Uh, but basically, the next assessment will be around 2020 and will tell us whether we're reaching this thing that still hasn't been defined called good environmental status. And it will allow us to see whether the good, good environmental status as we had defined it is valid, whether it was the right decision to choose those indicators, whether we were uh, defining good in a way that society in uh, 10 or 20 years will still regard as good. Uh, we hope uh, that society will be better informed and better in touch with the natural environment and care for it a little bit more than they do at the moment. Now there are three reasons why adaptive management can fail. First is uh, lack of trust of stakeholders. Uh, that might be because there's another problem that's even worse than the marine environment that they have to get to grips with and suddenly their attentions turn to something else. But it could be that they just don't trust each other and that old problems um, uh, keep re-emerging and, and keep stymieing efforts to uh, improve environmental management. So that's why projects like Spicosa and NOCES have a considerable element of how to build up, uh, uh, how to engage with stakeholders and work with the public and understand their dynamics. Uh, this building trust is a key element uh, towards uh, the application of, of approaches such as adaptive management. Poor monitoring and data transparency is really the Achilles heel of, a, of adaptive management. If you don't have the data, if you don't share it with people, if you're not honest about it, uh, and believe me, there is a lot of dishonesty with environmental data still, if you don't do that, adaptive management's bound to fail. But the third reason that it can also fail is through slipping baselines, that people with time just forget how it was in the past. They keep moving on and they keep accepting uh, what the system throws at them. They keep accepting that something can go extinct, disappearing, and that a habitat which they used to enjoy uh, has been exchanged for something made of concrete or, or some other structural or good that they have taken from the environment uh, in a, an irreplaceable way. So those are the three reasons that we constantly have to fight against. I think the future uh, is going to be one where rehabilitation becomes increasingly important. What we're doing with environments like the North Sea is changing them fundamentally. Imagine what happens when you fill uh, a sandy uh, bottom environment or a mud bank uh, with hard structures like wind farms or big new aqu aquaculture plants. You create uh, a new concrete or rocky habitat. You suddenly introduce new species. Uh, we're spreading species uh, in ballast water ships all over the planet anyway and we suddenly create a habitat for them. So uh, those changes are also often irreversible. So we are repopulating our sea areas with new species and we're providing new habitats for them and we better understand how that works. Uh, here in SAMS we've created uh, Europe's largest artificial reef just to see what happens when you uh, when you put these uh, um, elegantly named bio-blocks in the bottom of the sea. Uh, they're basically uh, like concrete blocks with holes in them and we're monitoring it to see exactly what happens when we create these new structures. It's important to know. It is possible that it, we, can do, we can introduce them in some places to actually uh, give nature a little bit of a hand and increase its connectivity to deal with things like climate change. Uh, it could be helpful, it could be unhelpful, but we need to study it to find out uh, how. And we need to model it as well uh, to see whether there is really a future for, uh, for a, little, a little bit of ecosystem engineering. It would be better if we could avoid it, uh, but uh, if it comes to saving species, we may well have to engage in those kinds of solution in the future. So my solution, my conclusions. First of all, there's no going back. We can only be stewards of the future and we have to understand that and work towards it. Our perceptions of the marine environment and values are critically important to its management and yet we pay very little attention to the study of values. Uh, it's values and perceptions that drive action in the world and we need to engage with those. Complexity though is very difficult to grasp, whether as a scientist or a decision maker. And the tendency will always be to look for those win-win solutions or those low-hanging fruit. So I'm saying here, let's stop talking about low-hanging fruit. Um, low-hanging fruit will be picked uh, whether or not we engage with them or not. And let's talking about stop talking about easy win-win solutions. 
Uh, because if they're that easy, somebody will grab them. We don't need to tell them. And let's focus on the wicked problems, the ones that really matter, the big ones, the big ones that require people to engage and form new values and hopefully do that, informed by the best kind of science that we can provide. Now, adaptive management is one way uh, towards implementing an ecosystem approach. It has pitfalls and risks. We have to understand that. And maybe somebody will come up with a better way. At the moment, it's all we have. And it's a good idea to work uh, towards it, uh, keeping a very clear mind about the importance of understanding uh, the long, taking the long view, understanding the past and moving towards the future. Thank you.